Hi, Mr. Richards here, and today's lesson is on interpreting graphs of functions. The first thing we're going to do is to interpret intercepts and symmetry. So, to interpret the graph of a function, estimate and interpret key features. The intercepts of a graph are points where the graph intersects an axis. The y-coordinate of the point at which the graph intersects the y-axis is called a y-intercept. Similarly, the x-coordinate of the point at which a graph intersects the x-axis is called an x-intercept. Example 1. The graph shows the cost at a community college, y, as a function of the number of credit hours taken, x. Identify the function as linear or nonlinear. Well, let's just start there. As we look at this, it looks to be a line, so we're going to write linear. Then, Estimate and interpret the intercepts of the graph of the function. Let's look at the x-intercept first. And this is where the graph crosses the x-axis. Well, here's the x-axis. This function is not crossing the x-axis at all. So, for x-intercept, we're going to write well, no x-intercept. And what this means is that the cost of college is never zero. Next, let's look into the y-intercept. The y-intercept is where the function crosses the y-axis, and this is going to appear to be somewhere right around this neck of the woods. And In fact, it looks like it's going to go right here around 50. And so for the y-intercept, we're going to say that this is about 50. The little squiggly equal signs means about. How can we interpret this? Well, let's say that there is an additional fee of $50 added to the cost charged per credit hour taken. So as we summarize example one, this shows how to identify the graph of a function as linear or nonlinear and how to interpret the intercepts. So it is linear. There was no x-intercept, which means the cost here never going to be zero. And the y-intercept, as we extend this function down, is about 50, which even if we take zero credit hours, we still have to pay $50. So that's a $50 charge that's added on top of the credit hours. Example 2 shows how to identify and interpret symmetry exhibited by the graph of a function. And we're going to use line symmetry to help us here. Now, a graph possesses line symmetry in the y-axis or some other vertical line.
if each half of the graph on either side of the line matches exactly. So in the example, the graph shows the cost y to manufacture x units of a product. Describe and interpret any symmetry. Well, if we look for a vertical line here that may split the graph exactly into two halves, I would think something right along this line would do. Here it looks like this left side is being matched by the right side. And so here we do have line symmetry and it looks like it's right around 30 units. And so the way we can answer this question is to say the right half of the graph is the mirror image of the left half around the line and this line here is when all of the X's are 30 for example, 3,200, 3,400, 3,600, 3,800, the X's are all 30. So the way we can describe this line, around the line, X equals 30. The symmetry of the graph... tells you that the cost to produce n more or n less then 30 units will be the same. So first we do have line symmetry around the line x equals 30 as the right side seems to be a mirror image of the left side. And what does that symmetry tell you? Well right here at 30 units it's costing about a little more than $500. Well, if we produce 10 more units, the cost is only increasing slightly. And producing 10 less units, the cost is also increasing just slightly. And this increase from 30 to 40 is matching the decrease from 30 to 20, at least in units. The cost is the same as you go as far away from the right side as you do on the left. So that's what it means to say that the symmetry of the graph tells you that the cost to produce n more or n less than 30 units will be the same. With 30 units is kind of our lowest manufacturing cost and then it's either going equally up as we increase the units for cost or equally up as we decrease the units for the cost. In the second part of this lesson, we're going to interpret extrema and end behavior. Interpreting a graph also involves estimating and interpreting where the function is increasing, decreasing, positive or negative, and where the function has any extreme values, either high or low. So 
we're going to describe a function as being positive or negative. Positive where the graph lies above the x-axis, such as where it's above the x-axis here and there. And negative where the graph lies below the x-axis, which is here and there. So that's positive and negative descriptions for our functions. What about increasing or decreasing? Well, a function is increasing where the graph goes up and decreasing when the graph goes down when you're moving from left to right. So here, as we go from left to right, the graph's going down, so it's decreasing, and then going back up, so we're increasing, and then back down as we're decreasing. The left to right is key there. Now, the points on this graph here and here are the relatively low or high function values. Those are called extrema. Point A here is a relative minimum since no other points that are nearby have a lesser y-coordinate. So it's a relative minimum. Point B is a relative maximum since no other nearby points have a greater y-coordinate. So a relative minimum and a relative maximum. What about end behavior? End behavior describes the values of a function at the positive and negative extremes of the domain. So here, as you move left, the graph goes up. As x is decreasing, y is increasing. That's the end behavior here. As x decreases, y increases. For this end behavior, as you move to the right, the graph goes down. So as x is increasing, y is decreasing. And we're going to use this key concept chart to help us on our next and last example. And now with example 3. The graph shows the population y of deer x years after the animals are introduced on an island. Estimate and interpret where the function is positive, negative, increasing, and decreasing the x-coordinates of any relative extremum and the end behavior of the graph. Let's take a look at the positive and negative first. Now remember it's going to be positive when it's above the x-axis and negative when it's below. Well, here's our x-axis and our function looks to be above the x-axis the entire time. So for that we can just say between 0 and now well, this point here looks to be about 5 and 6 tenths and we'll just call it that between 0 and 5 and 6 tenths years. What about when it's negative? And we just said it was positive the entire time so we can just say not negative. The function's never negative here. Now let's interpret what that means. There could not be a negative population. Pretty hard to have negative deer. Well, they might be, you know, sad, but we're not going to have negative amounts of deer. Now what about the increasing, decreasing part? Well, for increasing, it appears that our graph increases from right around here at one year all the way up to four years. That's what we can write. Between 1 and 4 years. What about when it was decreasing? Well, I see two points of decreasing here. At the beginning from 0 to 1 year, and here from 4 till our end at about 5 and 6 tenths year. So we need to list them both. 
between 0 and 1 year and between 4 and the 5 and 6 tenth years is what we're going to call that end. So for our interpretation, what we can write is the population dropped in the first year increased for three years and then dropped again until there were no more deer. So notice, for each of these categories, we're assessing, okay, where was it increasing, where is it decreasing, and writing an interpretation. Now, what about the x-coordinates of any relative extrema? Well, first thing we're going to look for are relative maximums. I would think one of our relative maximums, and maybe our only one, is up here at four years. So we could say it was a relative maximum at year four. What about our relative minimum? For these, there's really two. We have a relative minimum here at year one, where it bottomed out a little bit, and then certainly a relative minimum here at the end. So at year one and year, we're calling this five and six tenths there at the end, or relative minimums. Now, what does this mean? The deer reached its highest population at year four. They reached a relative low at year one and another at year 5.6 or 5 and 6 tenths when they decreased to a zero population. In other words, unfortunately, Bambi died. Now, what about the end behavior of the graph? As we scroll up to describe this end behavior here, Basically, as our x's were increasing, our y decreased. So, as x increased, y decreased. Again, just kind of take a look. As our x's are increasing, our y's went down. Well, we kind of hinted at this with our relative minimum of 5 and 6 tenths, but 
as the years passed. The deer population decreased to zero. So when you're called on an example to describe positive, negative, increasing, decreasing, relative extrema, and the end behavior of the graph, go through, list your data for positive and negative, and come up with an interpretation. List your data for increasing and decreasing, and come up with an interpretation. List your data for maximums and minimums, and list your data. And then lastly, for the end behavior of the graph. Now, this graph only was describing the end behavior here. On some graphs, you may have to look over here as well to see how it's ending there, but was not applicable in this graph. And that's it. And that is it for this lesson on interpreting graphs of functions. Good luck.